I like hot mics. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the greatest thing about giving a keynote is that um, a good keynote really shouldn't need fun. I should be able to come up in front of this room and convey all of my excellence in a fashion that all of you can understand in a format that doesn't need words. So it actually works out well anyways. And something that I've learned from speaking over the years is that sometimes you speak in rooms that have lights or actually skylights. So everyone who has fancy colorful slides, uh, <laughs> and literally my slides are black and white because I knew this was going to happen for some reason. So my talk today is entitled uh, Advice That I Wish Someone Would Have Told Me 20 Years Ago. And the preamble is, uh, first of all, I don't look like I could have been programming 20 years ago, but in reality, yeah, I have been. Uh, my first programming job was in 1994, so I've been programming for 22 years. I just turned 40, which in programming years is, you know, kind of old. But I don't. But I'm actually not an old person. And if if I could go back a few years and say, hey, younger Brian, if you knew these kinds of things, you would be so much more awesome than you are today. So the first thing that I was going to talk about, this would be like you can see a slide here, but there is no slide. So. The first thing we're going to talk about today is this whole concept of being the smartest person in the room. And the scenario is, I hear this all the time when people are saying, you should always be the dumbest person in the room. You know, you're going to learn more that way. Things are going to happen for you because when you're in this room, actually sucking up all this knowledge is going to be better for it. Um, that's kind of interesting, but I will give you all a little secret. I'm actually the smartest person in this room, and I will be willing to challenge anyone on that. If you want to go, want to go score standardized testing, I scored 36 on the ACT, and I scored a 1590 on the SAT. On the old test, when only had two parts, because we couldn't count that high. But I did score that, so measurably, I'm probably the smartest person in this room. <laughs> but that's not what I'm here to talk about. But what I'm going to talk about is that when I say I'm going to be the smartest person in this room, I actually just want to be the smartest person that I can be. Because smart is one of those really nebulous things where we have people who are book smart. Like they're, and you know, sometimes we say things like they're on the spectrum, they're really high up on the spectrum of autism, or you know, they're really smart at these things, but they can't actually tell you how to tie their shoe. And then you also have people who are super smart in like sports. They can go out there and they can see the Bills play and they can just look at these plays and they can be up in the booth and they can be calling these plays. And it's, you know, they're not actually that smart because they didn't lose to the Ravens on Sunday. But um, they can actually see that. And hold on, sidebar, I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> and I will tell you right now, the hottest things happening in the Bills teams from Baltimore. Tyrod Taylor, I love him. He was one of our greatest backup backs. Um, Ed Reed, one of your new defensive coordinators, he's actually the greatest safety of all time in football, but he was <laughs> the greatest safety of all time in football in Baltimore. But no, we do love you all. Thank you all for letting us win the first game. Um, <laughs> Very appreciative, and I actually like that game because it's a friendly game. Buffalo and Baltimore are actually kind of the same. Um, we're both steel towns, or ex steel towns, because the Japanese took that from us. But um, we are, but we, are, we come from the same cloth. There's a lot of good people here, a lot of good people there. And every time I come here, it's my second time. I really enjoy it. Sidebar over. I am exactly one Brian, and what I'm actually telling you is, whenever you want to be the smartest person, you can be only be the smartest person that you can be. And I can't give you those rules because guess what? That doesn't make any sense. I can't tell Nick Caronto how to be a smarter Nick Caronto. I would just say keep on doing those amazing things. And that's just something that I want everyone to remember. I am exactly 1.0 Brian, not 100% Brian, because multiplying with percentages is hard. It's harder than multiplying with with, um, with rational numbers. So whatever. So. Um, I like to give this little preamble before I actually start doing my talks. But I hate when speakers come in and they're like, hey, I'm such and such, just follow me on Twitter. But I haven't given you any reason to follow me on Twitter or Facebook or GitHub or Google Plus or LinkedIn. But you should do that anyways. So I just have to give a little bit before. So my name is Brian Lyles. I tweet at Brian L. And it's actually when I wish I did have slides because I stole 
Brian the proper way. My name is Brian. Brian, yeah. B R Y A N L. And I feel bad for all you people who are spelled B R I A N because that makes no sense. <laughs> uh, I actually work for a company called DigitalOcean. Who here has heard of DigitalOcean? All right. So the awesome. See, DigitalOcean, we're out here. Um, one of the things that people always tell me to say, the marketing people, they say, you got to talk about us. And really, I think our slogan today is, we are a cloud for developers. So if you're a developer, we're a cloud for you. But what does that really mean? Uh, really what it means is that we are a company, we are a four-year-old venture-backed startup who is, has the expressed interest of helping small companies, small teams of developers, and the individual developer get their projects online. Um, yes, I know there are very big incumbents in this market. I will not mention their names. But do we offer all the features they offer? No. But guess what? For 90% of the projects, for these smaller projects, you don't need all those features. And with our simple offering, that's actually going to be increasing in the next few months immensely, is actually more than good enough. So what do I do with DigitalOcean? Well, the first thing, it's funny, I'm actually going through my slides. <laughs> this slide is a nice blue. It's a white. It has one of the new DigitalOcean logo on it. So now, I, actually, I cut up the solutions team. And someone asked me earlier, like, what does solutions mean? Well, really what it means is that um, I was a developer there. I was one of the first developers of DigitalOcean, but I didn't want to be an engineer anymore. I think that being classified as an engineering is awfully limiting. Because everyone just says, oh, you're just an engineer. And that's why the lawyers, doctors, and whoever get paid more. I mean, we still do cool stuff, but we're always one step below them. So I was like, well, I'll smart you guys out. I'm just going to go be a salesperson. So I work in the sales work. My boss is actually the VP of sales. And I run solutions and developer advocacy. So my job is actually just to tell people how to build awesome things with DigitalOcean. So whether you want to do ops, I, mean, I, I know Terraform. I know all these ops projects very well. But if you also want to talk about programming, I do know Ruby. I actually spoke at Nickel Studio Ruby like next door a couple years ago. Um, I also know Go C++. I know Haskell. I know Camel. I know Ford. Um, I think I'm like over 20 languages that I can sit down and write code in. And so it allows me to just talk to developers on their level or administration people or people who are into DevOps. So that is another branch. And I also own our solutions architecting, which is a fancy way of saying that we have a GitHub repository full of Terraform scripts. <laughs> so, um, let's get back into this. So, about being the smartest person possible. I mean, I'm telling you to be 1.0 of whoever you are. Um, you know, I think that I need to give you a guide of how to do that. So, I actually do have a simple guide to learn anything. And this has gotten me through so many, so many uh, tribulations over the years, so many hard problems. And this all comes from a sketch on Saturday Night Live during, I guess it would have been during Obama's first election. And it was a small sketch, and it kind of looked like this. There's problems, and we have all these problems now in the world, and they hired some expert. And the expert was there to solve all the problems. So he's explaining this problem, and the guy says, this is how you do it. He says, first, you identify the problem, and then you fix it. <laughs> and then you find another problem, and then you fix it. And I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty crazy how easy that is. <laughs> so uh, I actually have a, a way of learning anything as well. So the first step, and I hate to tell you, you have to learn something. Um, for you to learn anything, you're going to have to actually take this hard step where you're not going to have any knowledge, you're going to have to learn something. And I'll give you a good example. Um, I uh, wanted to learn machine learning. Yeah, this is a few years ago, actually. Um, and I wanted to really get into machine learning. This is before deep learning, this is just regular old. Let's just talk about regressions. Everyone here know what regression is? It does not matter what regression is. I'm not here to teach you that. I'm just curious if you know what regression was. Regression is really kind of a funky way to um, figure out if something else is going to happen given, given some inputs. And a linear regression is, let's say you have a chart, and you have dots on that chart representing <coughs> something on two axes. And what you really want to do is you want to be able to draw a line on that chart and figure out, can I predict some other feature in the future? So, whether, so it's like um, baby weight and smoking. So 
how many packs a day did you smoke, and the baby weight would be on the y on the, So, how many packs did you smoke would be on the y-axis, and the baby weight would be on the x-axis. So we could get this data and get create a regression. This is probably not good math, but I'm sure something will happen. So I wanted to learn machine learning, and the problem is, is that you gotta you need to know something. We can't all we can't work, walk into computers and programming without knowing something. So really, what you need to do is I'm saying when I say learn something, you need to know something. In this case, I just need to know a little bit of linear algebra. And to this point, I mean, I went through school and I was actually good at linear algebra, but I was only good at it in the book way, where I could pass any test that you gave me in linear algebra, but I would never know. I would never have an application where I would say this is where I'm going to just bust out a matrix, a matrix, and this will solve all my problems. But just remember, learn something. So here's, so that's step one. Step two is actually more interesting. Um, step two is, if you want to learn something new, you should always learn that new thing in the kind of context of something you already know. And the example here is pretty cool. Uh, so let's say we know the Pythagorean theorem. Does everyone know this? Just shout it out. No, not everybody knows that, actually. You, you'd be very surprised how much our country is so happy to be ignorant about simple things like that. Um, if I, here, I expect everyone here to know a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But, you know, I went somewhere else, and I gave this, comp and I gave this talk in a general audience, and I said Pythagorean theorem, somebody might say that I yelled a slur at them. So we need to, we need to, so it's, it's a weird thing, but it is a truth. So, I want to learn how to um, do something new, new programming language. Let's say I, I'm actually going to start learning F sharp. Something I'm going to do. So what I would always do, since I know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared, when I'm learning F sharp, I will always write a Pythagorean theorem solver in the new language because I'm only learning one thing and I'm not learning two things. A lot of times, and we, I see this with boot camps, People who are, you know, they're teachers or they're something else, and they're like, well, I want to be a programmer. So they hop into these classes and they're like, and they say, well, you're just going to learn Rails. So they throw some Rails at them, but we don't throw any of the theory of HTTP behind it. They don't understand what happens when you do a GET. And, you know, they tell you, oh, we have controllers, but they don't tell you why. They don't understand why, you know, you have the, the um, HTTP RFC, why that is like that is. Why do we have all those verbs? Why is this actually this way? What is the history behind that? So really what we're trying to do is, if we're teaching something, we should be teaching, we should be teaching the new things in the context of something we already know. And the third thing that I always say is that, now that you've learned this new thing, so now that I've learned F sharp, now I need to stretch. I need to take that knowledge of F sharp, and I need to write something that will probably be pretty hard. Maybe I won't solve it, maybe I will. So now you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a Monte Carlo simulator in F sharp. Why not? Because um, I actually do know what a Monte Carlo simulator is. But it's a stretch because it's not something that's trivial. It's something that, you know, I would have to actually think about for a few weeks. And really all you're trying to do is you're not trying to accomplish that goal. You're just trying to cement the knowledge that you learned in step two into something that you can actually talk about. And the fourth step is we just do this over and over again. And you'll find that if you get into this pattern, what you're going to do is you're going to realize you're learning all the time. And no, even though as we get older and we get better in, in our craft, we find that I just want to go, I want to go peek around this corner because I always want to know all about these new hard things that I think we can learn. So that was the end of my guide to learning. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is passion. And passion is one of those words that I would go into like, you know, everyone's like, I got passion. And I'm going to probably say that a lot of us don't have the passion that, you know, that we think we do. So, the first thing I want to say is that we're lucky. How many of you all write software at home when no one pays you? Yeah, I'm going to guarantee that unless you're a weirdo, that you're not a doctor that goes home and operates on stuff. <laughs> And you know, if you're an accountant, and you're a good accountant, you know, you're CPA, you're CPA plus, 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 so I don't know how that works in CPA land, but um, if you're CPA, you don't just go home and say, well, I'm going to have some debits, and I'm going to have some credits. No one does that. We leave our jobs at the end of the day, and we go home and we write more job stuff. That is, that's pretty lucky, and not that we have to, it's because we want to. I mean, I have friends here. I was actually 
in the virtual room when Nick Carato says, I'm going to create this thing and it's going to do Ruby Gems and I'm going to serve Ruby Gems. I was there when that happened and I remember that conversation and we were kind of like, all right, Nick, okay. <laughs> but guess what? He did it and it's still going on. It's still amazing. Jim Cutter, good job, Nick. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we are the lucky ones. I like to, I mean, I, I am not afforded all the privileges in life um, due to just things and things. You know, my parents weren't rich. I happen to be brown. But I will definitely recognize my privilege when it comes to being an efficient and caring person and actually loving that I can come and share these crazy ideas to other developers. So I do, I recognize that as my privilege, and I am one of the lucky ones. But now I do want to talk about passion versus obsession. Some of the times, people are like, I'm really passionate about Ruby. I'm really passionate about Elixir. I'm really passionate about JavaScript. Well, actually, JavaScript people are way worse than this about anything else. <laughs> I'm really passionate about systems programming. I'm really passionate about containers. In a lot of cases, it's not passion. It's actually an obsession. And I'm not here to tell you whether you're wrong or right, because who am I to tell you that you're wrong or right? I can silently judge you all day long. But you know what, when I actually, I don't ever want to tell anyone that you're a weirdo. I'm not trying to look at anyone when I say that. No, I'm sorry. Do you mean we're not all weird? Yeah. No, no, and you know, we are, we're all, we're all weird in our own ways. As a, as a kid, who just goes into their basement and hacks on their computer if they're not just a little weird. Um, um, but I want us to understand that we can, and a good example would be um, kids and uh, their, their devices, their iPads, and they watch things on the internet. When we were little, whenever I got bored, my mom would say, go outside. She would be like, Brian, you are annoying me. Leave the house. These <laughs> uh, days, uh, kids expect to be uh, stimulated all the time. We did it. We created all these cool devices where they could have constant stimulation. You know, when we watched cartoons, it was Saturday, or maybe in the afternoons after school. I could go turn on Nickelodeon right now, and there's cartoons on, or I could go to their app and watch anything I want at any time. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that just because code is in front of you all the time, we, don't, we should not feel the need to be in it all the time. Be in it until it becomes enjoyable, and then we stop. And that's, that's a hard lesson. So what are my passions? Well. Um, I actually care about, I know I don't know all of you, but I do care about all of your successes. I mean, I want you to succeed to like the point where you are like 0.9 of me. <laughs> but I do care. I know it's horrible, but it's true. Um, but I do care. I, 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 the reason I come and speak at these conferences is because I want to show that when someone sees someone like me come up and speak and, and they get some kind of inspiration from like that time when Brian spoke about that thing, that really made me go do this thing. And that's the thing that I'm really happy about. I really want to be your person to help you do whatever you want to do. We'll talk about that again in a little bit. So what are your passions? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever take a step back and you think, well, after you make enough money to pay the bills, hopefully you are all making enough money to pay the bills. I mean, I really hope that. And not because I think that um, that we all are getting paid that way. I just hope that anyone. I hate to see that you know we have jobs out there that have wages that don't actually allow people to pay their rent, have a car, and then eat. Why should they have to make a choice between those? So I hope that everyone has that. So there was a funny picture. There was a slide that says sidebar. I don't even know why I put that in there. Um, but next thing I want to talk about is leveling up your career. And the caveat that I have on here is it's leveling up your career without becoming someone you hate. Because it's really easy. I'll tell you, if you want to be rich, if you, oh no, if you want to be wealthy, there's an easy way to be wealthy. I, I actually tell you how to do this. You basically, you do well in high school, you go to a pretty good college, you learn computer science and stuff, and then you go apply to a couple companies. You either apply to like the, the Google, I mean, or Google, Facebook, Apple in the Valley, or you go to uh, one of the big consulting places. So you go to Bain, McKinsey, and Accenture, you do that. You 
Your first year, 22 years old, you will probably make $100,000 a year. I mean, cash ahead. 10 years in, you might be making $300,000 a year. And if you take that, if you take $300,000 and you add for $33,000 and you multiply that by three, just think about that. Every three years before taxes, you're pulling in a million dollars. I mean, you got to pay Uncle Sam, and if you have kids, you got to pay for that. And if you have an ex wife, you got to pay for her. Or an ex husband, you have to pay for him. Or just an ex spouse. But think about that. You've actually created for yourself a million dollars. But you might hate yourself for doing all that stuff. Um, there's another way, and, I, and I'm actually, I'm not talking about money. I'm not actually as crazy about money as it sounds. Um, um, the first thing I'll say is that you only strive to attain what you need. And what does that mean? Well, what's your passion in life? What do you like? What makes you happy? Um, I've had a couple examples in my career where I've actually been extremely successful and, and people gave me stuff and I didn't know what to do with it. And now, you know, I work for a startup and they pay me, they actually pay me pretty well, but the money past a certain point, past, you know, paying for my house, my bills, um, how much of money I have to give away, and then like a, a fun thing or two, everything else, and then savings for whenever I get older, everything else is an extra. And I'm not, I'm not in the mindset where I think that, you know what, if I had $10 million, what would I do with it? Well, I'd probably give nine of it away because why? I'm sitting on this money um, and it's not doing the world any good. All I'm doing is keeping this wealth and I'm basically making banks money. And why would I want to do that? I mean, I'm not hating on banks. I actually think banks are very important, but I can be doing so much better with my money. So I'm only thinking to myself that I'm only going to try to get what I can actually use. And another thing that I want people to understand, so if you don't want to hate yourself, um, you got to learn how to distance your work from a chore. Because everyone, you know, we write code. We love Greenfield projects. I love starting a new project and just writing it and compiling it. And I'm like, and I, yeah, I say compiling it. I write Go and C++ mainly these days. So I actually have to compile that. For you Ruby people, it's like, um, when you run Ruby, whatever, it like creates an executable, so I never need the Ruby command anymore. So hopefully that helps. Uh, <laughs> but really what it is, is that I want to learn how, or actually I do know how to do this now, is that I don't want my work to be a chore. I don't want my, my career, anything that I've ever decided to do, to actually feel like, oh, I have to go to work. And like, you know, I go to work, I, I work from home now, but I do travel a lot. Every morning when I work at the Digital Ocean, I'm always like, yeah, you know, this is pretty exciting. I'm going to do some pretty cool things today. And I'm only sticking that to myself. At the point where, and even though it's not even a testament about the company, the company is great, I would actually encourage everyone who will apply really want to work there. Um, but think about this. If your job is something where you're like, ugh, I have to go write this code again, or I have to write these tests, or I have to talk to this person, at that point, your job, your work, has become a chore, and there's a couple things you can do. First of all, I would probably, for me, I would quit, because I, I value being happy over anything else. And the second thing you can do is you can figure out what that problem is, and you should go fix it. And you know we have a higher amount of burnout in our industry. And one of the reasons we do is because people internalize that stuff. Whenever you just, when you look at what makes all your money as a chore, you start to hate life. And when you start to hate life, you get this burnout thing, and things never are good. But think about that. We're in industries where, you know, a low computer programming job would be in like 60 k <coughs> That's still above what middle class is. And I had this conversation with someone last night. Think about it. Uh, developers in our industry, um, for, and you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about regional areas, but software developers in general aren't that middle class that, we're, that our government is thinking about helping. They actually make less than we do. So we need to think about that whenever we're making all these decisions and thinking that we're the middle, we're not the middle. Not even close. So this, is, this next thing is a, a particular rant that I have, and I, I hear this all the time, and I just want to, I'm glad this is being recorded. I'm actually going to snip this piece out of the talk. I'm just going to send this to people when I see them doing it. Um, last week, I was on a podcast, and a young lady on there said, I see this person, and I just love what they're doing. They're on, they have this site, they're talking at this conference, they're doing all these amazing things, and I just wish I could be like her. And I'm like, well, no, actually, that's the wrong thing. 
we need to stop. First of all, we can't model our, we can't model ourselves on someone else's successes. We got to stop doing that. When you idolize someone else's success, you forget about all the hard work. You forget that the only reason that they know how to do that thing is because they had no friends. And the only thing they were doing is at home was practicing this thing. Like, we'll just say playing the piano. The reason they play that melody so well is because it's all they did for five years. And we don't like to talk about that piece. What we like to talk about is, look at how nice they play now. So we gotta stop modeling that. We have to, if, you're gonna, if you wanna pattern yourself off someone else, you need to ask them, so, how did you get here? And not only do you need to ask them how did they get there, you gotta ask them how they felt as they, was getting, as they were getting there. Because you need to understand that, because that success is only, no, success only comes from all the hard work and all the feelings they had before. Next slide. I really wish you could see these totally slides. So, this next thing is, um, one path of not hitting yourself is, this term has actually died down, but I still have to talk about it, the term of a 10x developer. Nothing worse than a 10x developer. And you know what? There are 321 million United States citizens. There are 7 billion people in the world. Best believe, just, I mean, I'm not great at math, but I know math. That math says that there are people who are 10 times better than anyone in here. There are probably people who are 15 to 20, 30, 40 times better than anyone in here. You probably will never meet that person. And we see on we see on, on forums, we see it in job descriptions where people are looking for, I hate to say it, I know this, here comes the cringe part, Rockstar, Ninja, you know, 10x developer. And you're like, oh, I hate that. But people are trying to be that developer, they're trying to be a 10x. So I can actually give you a simple prescription of how to be a 10x. Um, unless you are a, a one-person consultant, see, you are a team. And really, we should not measure, I mean, only when it comes to review time, and, and still be very careful about measuring the, the output of an individual. What we really should be doing is measuring the aggregate. And as a, and really all we should be doing is trying to make everyone around us better. So, you know, if you're better at this kinds of algorithms and actually just doing algorithm work, you should be giving that knowledge to other people. And if you understand how testing works or you understand how systems work, you should be giving that knowledge. And really what you're doing is every time you give that knowledge and someone doesn't have to ask you, you're actually increasing the multiplier of the team because you were you're very important because you were there on the team, but you're also super important because you give other people tidbits so they can grow. So now you're just multiplying and your multiplier will go up. So just think about that. So because it's a keynote, I can talk about whatever I want. And um, slide 31 says my life plan on it. So I always knew I was going to go into computers. Uh, my father taught me a computer when I was 12, because he was in the Army. And he said, he worked at, actually, I'm not kidding you, my dad worked at some secret military base where they did crazy stuff. And he's like, they're all talking about this stuff right now. Maybe you should learn it. And he brought me a computer, and he bought me books. And these are programming manuals in C. So I thought that programming was C. Like I didn't get the, I didn't get any, I didn't, this is way before the web. I mean I was only 12 years old, so then in the 80s. Anybody remember the 80s? Come on now. <laughs> Pick on the old lady, yeah. No, it's not that. I remember almost all, I remember that most of the 80s. Like the best music, are you kidding me? I remember most of the 80s. And now, you know, I have some people that I mentor are in their low 20s. I'm like, and they're calling me sir. <laughs> Matter of fact, F you and your permits. I'm not gonna use, I don't use those words, but um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, at, a, at a very young age, I knew I was gonna do computers. So I knew that I was gonna get a job doing computer things. But you know, people who aren't in this industry like to say, so what do you do? I program computers. And they're like, yeah, pretty cool. And they're not, and they keep on walking. And think about it, there's people who write Fortran, there's like people who, run, who wrote all of the Fortran calculations for doing everything that's fast on the internet right now. Like, you realize that there's one math, math there's two mathematical projects that power like every other fast thing on the internet, and it's written in Fortran. Pretty crazy. But then you have people who, who are starting off in HTML, and they're, they call themselves programmers. You know, they're starting on JavaScript, they, they call themselves programmers, but are they the same thing? No, they're not the same thing. And that's not bad. 
Because you know what? There's doctors that pull babies out, and there's doctors that do other things as well. So, like I, I always say this, it takes all types to make a community. But I knew I was going to do this. So, um, now that I've had some level of success in this, um, I actually have a new plan. And my new plan now is sharing my life lessons, whether they're hard life lessons or soft life lessons, about I want to help people who are getting into software development, I want to help you level up your career. But you know, and that's where a lot of people stop. Like, I want to help developers. But there's another thing that we don't realize is that there are people who could be great developers that don't even know this because due to life, they didn't get good high school education, they couldn't afford college, you know, and now they work to do things like I drive a bus because guess what? It's a job and it pays me every week. Or, you know, we do sanitation, or we do this. And those people could be good developers too. So now I've been thinking about is how can I create a launching point for people who can't find this career? Because I'll tell you what, it is a Thursday and it is 1025 and I have basically just been shoveling stuff with you. It may be right, it may not be right, but look at that, that's a great privilege. And I want others to be able to at least have the opportunity to one day get in front of a crowd and just talk crap for half an hour. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I say that to make you laugh, but really what I'm saying is that um, we, as an industry, need to figure out how to increase our, I hate the word pipelines, because when we say pipelines, they talk about diversity and then they talk about the size of it. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that our industry isn't very accessible for people who aren't in the know. And I don't know how we do this, but it's something that I think about as I am as not waiting, actually, as I am approaching my climax. Because I have plenty more good years. And the last thing that I think of in my life plan is being happy. Um, how many of you can say that you're happy at what you do? But you're just like, this is amazing, I'm super happy. Um, and that's just, I mean, this, most of you in here are like, yeah, I'm happy. Come on. Um, I work, my brother does uh, high voltage electrical events. It's dangerous. As a matter of fact, last year, about a year ago, he literally got blown up. And they thought they were going to give him spin grabs, but he's kind of a jerk. And a fighter, so he left. And, um, and I think about that. My job, the hardest thing that I might get, if something might happen to me, I might trip on the way to the bathroom. I might get carpal tunnel, or you know what? Um, I might get a little bit of headache. I look at the computer too long. And I think that you know, if those are the worst things that can happen to me physically, um, how I'm super happy where I am, and I want other people to be super happy where they are. So we're on the we're on the, we're on the downswing now. So where do we go from here? And I really wish I could show you this slide. I'm actually going to read verbatim. It says. I'm keynoting a, code, a coding conference and not talking much about coding. And then there was a troll face. <laughs> and then there was something that says spoiler alert. I don't know what I was thinking here. It would have been better on the screen. Ah, I know what I'm talking about. Um, so this whole thing, we call, most of us in here are developers, or we work in some process to support the development and the sale of software. I'm pretty much, I'm going to guess that's what most of us in here do. Um, but we have to realize that, you know, creating software is more than typing on the keyboard. And sometimes we forget that. We always think that, hey, we're the developers. I developed this. But now we have a generation of developers, and I'm going to give you a, one of those back in my day talks. In my day, the people who wrote the software actually had to deploy the software. And we didn't baby, we, I mean, we didn't make any baby noises. We didn't complain when we actually had to take that tar file and copy it to a server. These days, I actually be running to developers and I'm like, well, we just write software, someone else deploys it. And I'm like, no, no, stop that. Stop calling yourself a full stack developer and think that's all you can do. Which gets me on to another ramp. I'm going to pick on someone in here. Does anyone here have the title full stack developer? Oh, I didn't know that you want. <laughs> it's not your fault. The man did this to you. <laughs> um, the people who figured out what the stack was, you know, the stack is tall. The stack goes down to bits and bytes, and it goes out to whatever else you're delivering. But, you know, if you're writing JavaScript, and you're in a web, you can write code for a web browser, and you actually happen to be able to write code for a server, 
that's actually really promising you to call yourself a full stack because there's networking code. There's code that's actually, you know, there's, we can think of the OSI model. I know I'm using the word that a lot of people don't even turn on, don't even know, the OSI model. It's talking about the layers of networking. So you go all the way down from the physical and you go into basically what your presentation layer is. So you can see what's coming out of your web browser. There's a lot of stuff in there. And if your stack only touches the top, like layer seven, which is actually the top of the OSI model, you are not a full stack developer. My ploy is that we actually need more full stack developers. We need more developers who aren't afraid of SSH. But then we need more developers, and then some of you are like, yeah, I'm not afraid of SSH. But then we need developers who understand why actually logging into servers is wrong, because every time you log into a server, you leave a footprint behind. That actually makes that server different than every other server in a cluster. So by logging in, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. And we need developers who understand the power of automation. And, the, and we need developers who understand that servers are ephemeral. The point at which you give a server a name, you basically have made a pet. And I know there's this whole pet versus cattle conversation, but you've made a pet. Wayne said one's here, I know, because um, I hear sheep. But there's so many, and what I'm, only, thing, only point that I'm trying to make to you is that there's so much more involved and that we can constantly be improving. Because I'm sure that I've said something here where people are like, well, I have no idea what he's talking about. So hopefully, just go Google it. Google me. I have some good pictures on the internet where I'm actually bigger than I am now. I'm actually, this year, I'm down 30 pounds. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I didn't do it by dieting, because that was someone else's plan. My plan was, actually, I'll tell you what, this, and this, this is, just shows how my mind thinks. You know how I lost weight? I went to the doctor because I wanted to, I was going to India and I wanted some Cipro because I was sure that I was going to get something while I was drinking water in India, even though I stayed in the hotel the entire time I was there. But what I did is I got some Cipro. I took my blood pressure and they're like, you have pre-hypertension. I'm like, well, what the hell is that? And I went and looked it up and I realized that the, the way to solve that was to lose weight. So I didn't lose weight because I thought I was heavy. I just um, lost weight because I thought the world needed me for a little bit longer, so I'm going to be healthier. But you know, think about that. In my mind, that's what it took for me. It didn't take me eating healthy to do that. It's like, no, I just don't want to die next year. So just think about that. That's what drives me. So um, I'm going to leave you with a couple things. Um, understand the power of words. Notice I gave you a talk with no slides, and I was pretty confident in doing this. I actually had no problem. I probably could have given this talk mostly from memory. Um, and, I don't, and I know why, because I only wrote it yesterday. But I had the notes for weeks. I just like to wait until the absolute last minute to create slides, because you never know how you feel about colors. So remember the power of words. Power of words are good. Uh, I actually have more than three or four people now who work with big companies that said that I am here now because of something you said to me in passing in 1995, or something you said to me where you were yelling at me about how bad my code was and I didn't understand, but now I see what you were talking about. It's the passion. I want all of you all to do good. I want all of you all to be great. And then whenever you get there, I want you to say that it's something that Brian said to me on September 15, 2016 got me there. I don't want any money. I just want that footnote in your um, memoir. And I'll leave you with one last thing. I want to be your Apollo. I can't be your muse, because I look this word up. And muse, actually, it's a, it's a gender term. And I had to go figure out what the male counterpart with this is. And, and then it took me like way off on the internet. I actually got into simulations of drugs. I don't understand how I got there. But then I wound my way back, and I found that Apollo is actually the proper word here. So I want to be the reason that you think, or no, actually, I shouldn't say that. Like, I want to be one of the reasons that you think that you could be great, and I want to be one of the reasons that you go out and do great things. So, with that, the end.